Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht, um, Managing Director of Membership of the National Space Society. And on behalf of my colleague, Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I would like to welcome you to our Space Forum this evening, Turning Orbital Trash into Space Treasure. I think Yay. we're for a fun, yes, a fun discussion. <laughs> so as always, welcome to our Space Forums. We know we've been doing these for quite some time now, and we certainly <laughs> appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for another informative and fun discussion tonight. As always, in terms of our agenda, we start off with a little bit of etiquette. I have a few NSS announcements to make. Then we'll have a short introduction to what's coming up next with our space forms. And then we'll get right into the program. And then, of course, we'll close out uh, after the uh, program ends. So as always, in terms of our virtual etiquette, it's really about uh, submitting questions. Uh, we do encourage you to use the Q&A function. Uh, that is seen typically by the panelists and it doesn't have all the other discussion that's typically in the chat. So it's a little easier for us uh, to just pick things out. Uh, but feel free to use the chat to make comments, to ask questions as well. We just ask that you be respectful of the panelists uh, and the audience. And we did get a lot of questions beforehand, and uh, our speaker will be talking about that uh, as we go, in, uh, go through the program. As always, we do encourage you to give to our cause. Uh, if you're enjoying programs like these space forums and the town halls, we encourage you to support NSS for your donations. We certainly appreciate your membership and your, call, your giving to NSS uh, to support all the great programs we do. So thank you in advance for that. I will post the link uh, in the chat as I typically do, so you can easily get to that page. Uh, after the forum is over, uh, please take a few minutes to complete the uh, post-forum uh, survey. It only takes a couple minutes to complete. Uh, it's anonymous, and it really does help us uh, in planning uh, future events and uh, addressing things that you'd like to see uh, to improve the overall program. I also have a big announcement. You're going to hear a lot more about this uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but uh, we have actually launched a new office uh, at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Uh, it's located in the Astronauts Memorial Foundation's Center for Space Education, located right on the Visitor Complex uh, land. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're connected directly with what's happening in space uh, to both NASA and a lot of other organizations. So it's going to give us an opportunity to possibly explore new programs. But more importantly, this is about better serving the membership, your needs uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, I'm actually gonna be staffing the office and I'm excited about that. I'm already starting to get to know a lot of members directly. So we're there to support your membership needs and any other related inquiries. So please take a snapshot or screenshot of this uh, so you can get our address and phone number. You, As always, you can reach us through the email, membership at nss.org. Uh, in terms of the hours, not we're not staffed the entire five days a week, 20, you know, eight hours a day, but uh, we guarantee we'll be getting back to you if you do call uh, as fast as possible. We're really going to try to improve uh, the level of service. Uh, for you as members. So more to come. You'll be hearing more about that in some emails. You'll be hearing more about that in some messages we'll be sending out. Uh, but we're really looking forward to uh, really being part of the NSS community uh, and making sure we're meeting all of your needs and improving your actual membership experience. So looking forward to that. Uh, as I said, we'd like to also discuss what's coming up. This is the same schedule that I had uh, last week. Uh, what going through March, we've got 200 years of space tourism on the 9th. We've got our space health contest winner on the 23rd. Uh, March 9th, uh, we've got Christina Corp, Space for a Better World, and uh, Space Pult Solar Power presentation. So we're lining up a lot of other things uh, through the ISDC. We will be definitely having a special session uh, in April about the ISDC. 
uh, and everything that's going to be happening there. So we'll hopefully encourage you to, to come out to Frisco, Texas, uh, and take part in that. But you'll be hearing more about that and upcoming space forums uh, as we move along. So now uh, it's my pleasure to actually introduce our program for the evening and our speaker. And as we said before, our topic is turning orbital trash into space treasure. So I think you're in for a really interesting discussion. So let me introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, that is Al Anzadula. He is a currently the uh, NS, a member of the NSS Policy Committee, but he's a former NSS Executive Vice President. He's also the former chair of the Policy Committee, a member of the International Committee, and also a member of our Board of Directors. And he comes uh, from a professional standpoint, third, you know, a, a retired State Department uh, diplomat. Uh, who has been invested in space advocacy uh, for more than 30 years. So I think you're going to find a very interesting discussion tonight. So Al, I'm going to turn this over to you. Great. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm very excited about this. In fact, I'm thrilled because uh, this gives me an opportunity to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that's orbital debris. It's threat and it's promise. And I want to thank you, Bert, as well as um, as Larry and, and Fred for putting this together. And I see your lineup there. You've got Peter Gerritsen and, and Grant uh, coming up. And, um, you know, I think you're going to be, folks uh, listening in right now are going to be very um, uh, happy to hear those folks and their ideas. I'll be talking about some of them uh, in my presentation, in fact. So... The other thing, there's two other things I wanted to say, and one is that while it's true, I am a member of the, still a member of the policy committee and the international committee, as well as on the board, not everything I say will necessarily be uh, uh, policy driven. Uh, I may uh, diverge in a couple of areas uh, where I think it would be interesting to the listeners. Uh, but I'll let you know when that happens. The other thing is that uh, I am blessed with seeing a lot of your questions ahead of time. And uh, there was, and I and I hope to address them in my presentation. But if I don't at the end, we can take a QA afterwards at the end. But I, I, I just wanted to highlight some of them. I had a question about when do you think this technology can be used? Uh, a question about the international implication, whose property is a dead satellite? That is a very interesting question that I'm going to go into. Because there are, there are two, at least two layers of ownership or more. We'll get to that. And linked to that is a, another question, ownership of the debris, pay or not? And then there's another one that's linked to that. Someone said, if you launch it, you have to remove it. Okay, we're going to talk about that. And finally, there was one question, um, and I, I'm going to try to address them all, but these, these four, five questions here uh, kind of stood out. Um, what is the role of NEPA? And that one, I never expected. So <laughs> I had to actually do a little research on that. NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, and it's a very good question. Uh, I had never thought about NEPA before, but we'll get to it. Anyway, so can I go ahead and share my screen, uh, Bert? Uh, yep, you're all set, Al. Okay, here we go, folks. Hang on. One moment. I believe this is mine and not yours, right? All right, so... Yes, well, everybody knows this. We're going to be talking about turning trash into treasure. And so we need to know, gosh, how much trash is there? And uh, how much do you think it's going to be worth? Well, let's see what others say. You'll notice from this first slide, first of all, though, that, um, and this is something I'm going to be talking about over and over again. There was a live demonstration 
um, at the Colorado School of Mines, and it involved all these astroscale, cislunar, Newman space, and so forth. It involved all of these uh, these uh, nano racks also, uh, and others. It involved all of the collaboration of all of these people, and that's something that's, that I'm going to be emphasizing. This is one of the new things that's happening. The, the, the amount of collaboration is really amazing. I was out of the picture you know, because of travel and COVID and so forth for, uh, you know, two and a half years or so. And I was literally shocked by everything that had happened in the meantime. So let's go to the next. I think what's important and what I've really realized is that we really are at the dawn of a new space edge. The, people call this, you know, an inflection point and so forth. It really is. In the last two and a half years, things have really changed. Active satellites doubled over two years. There are over 600 space startups now. 70 countries have space agencies. And here's a big one. The space market is now over 447 billion. And the partial part of that, 350 billion, and it's headed for 1 trillion within, depending on who you want to believe, whose estimate you want to believe, it's either within 10 to 20 years to 15 to 20 years. So this is really, really an exciting time for people, space enthusiasts like ourselves to be involved. So, okay, so why is this happening? What's, it's happening because of several things are happening in industry, standardization of interfaces and hardware, modularity, Plunging development costs, and that's the big one. Plunging development costs due to miniaturization, 3D printing, and mass production of off-the-shelf components. So, plunging launch costs, that's a huge one too. Just think about this, folks. $36,000 a kilogram to get to low Earth orbit with the space shuttle. $36,000 a kilogram. Then, you know, with some of the heavy boosters from the, the heritage companies, $10,000 a kilogram, right? Well, SpaceX comes along. Everybody's saying, oh, space is hard. You know, he'll never do it, et cetera. But he'll never reuse boosters. Well, he's got it down with the Falcon Heavy to $1,500 a kilogram. And some people say, we'll see. But the Starship is about to launch. And that looks like maybe $100 per kilogram. Or, at least, or maybe 120 per kilogram, but whatever. It's you can see that this is causing this plunge in launch costs and development costs is 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 like an explosion in the space field. Um, so, and here's another one I already mentioned: increasing collaboration and cooperation among governments, private sector, academia, and all these merging uh, new companies, and. Along with all of that, Moore's Law for AI, machine learning, and robotics. And I guess you all know what Moore's Law is. But again, here we are on the threshold of really fantastic stuff. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm sure everybody listening to this has been, has been thinking, having wild fantasies about, about the possibilities of, of learning, of, of exploring and living in space, living and working in space. But what is the big problem? The big problem is irresponsibility. And, you know, it's sleepwalking debris into space. From look at this, look here first at this. You see, this is sort of, this is NASA's version trying to show us how much debris has, has accumulated. But I can tell you this from 1957. To 1967, there were 83 overflights uh, by the United States and Soviet Union. There were good practices, some people would say best practices that came out of that, such as the right to overfly a country, you know, in your orbit, or even as you're going to orbit. I think that's a pretty good practice. But also, there was a very bad practice came out of it, and that is 
leaving our trash in space. And by trash, I mean not only um, dead satellites, but upper stages. So let's look at to see who's responsible for that. Well, the big three, Russia, United States, and China. Okay, that's, the, that's who's responsible for most of the space junk. And it, not all of it, you, the empty, the empty uh, upper stages became junk right away. Right? But the satellites didn't necessarily become junk right away, but eventually, you know, through collisions and because, or because of batteries that weren't discharged properly and that sort of thing, or, or fuel, that was not discharged property, uh, they became junk. Now here is a, is a graph that's actually out of date, but the pattern of it is not, uh, okay, I, I, there's something at the top of my recording, I guess, I hope nobody can see that. It's, there's like a bar across the top of my slides. I'm assuming, uh, Bert, that no one else can see that. Uh, it's um, clear now. Okay, great. So, so what are we talking about here? Now, these numbers are a little mushy, depending on who you listen to. You know, if it's the Europeans or the people in the United States or, or the Space Force, but it's, they're about right. There's, there's about 50,000 trackable orbital debris objects. Now, trackable means that they're, they're probably the size of 10 centimeters across. There are a hundred million more, more than a hundred million untrackable orbital debris objects. Okay, and that's shrapnel. Think about shrapnel. And anything the size of a quarter of an inch to on uh, on up is dangerous. The and they're, and they're dangerous even at these at these even small pieces because the relative impact velocity uh, velocities. It reads 57,000 kilometers per hour. So getting back to this graph here, uh, the, the numbers here uh, of or people of, of objects in orbit are, are no longer relevant. But I, I want to show you the mass here, the total mass. You can see that there's a pattern here. And this answers one of the questions I got on my sheet today, over two dozen questions. And that is, what how long does this stay? This stuff stay up. Well, if you look here, you see 460, 540 uh, uh, kilometers altitude. All right, stuff down there, it stays up. You know, from weeks to months to a few years, right? Okay, so you get to about 620. You see that big bar? Why is it so big? Well, one of the reasons is because it starts staying up. It takes many decades, okay? Because the atmosphere, um, this is just this is another one of the points I want to make. The atmosphere just doesn't stop cold at the Kármán line, which is which is 100 kilometers altitude. It doesn't just stop. It actually just keeps attenuating all along from from the the surface of the Earth. So so. There's drag, there's atmospheric drag, and the, the, the sun, how much the sun is, is the, the, the power of the sun also has a lot to do with this, what phase of the sun the sun is in. That has a factor. But in general, by the time you get here, you're talking about, by the time you're getting 6, 620, 700, you're talking about decades up there, decades. By the time you get to 780, 800, you're talking about centuries. When you get back here, you're talking about thousands of years. Now, this is all, all these orbits, this is all low Earth orbit here. Okay, so how much do we have? Well, it looks like we have about 8,000 tons of debris. Now, that debris is mostly uh, aluminum alloy, but not, not completely. There's, there's copper and there's some steel and so forth, but, uh, and it's valuable. It's very valuable, but it's not valuable if no one can get it. But we'll, we'll get to that point. Now, here's a big jump here. When I, two and a half years ago, when I left this, when I started on my uh, journey to Italy and, and so forth, um, this number was half of what it was. There were more 
defunct satellites and many, many thousands of upper stage bodies. That, but, but just with sticking with defunct satellites, or there were many more than there were uh, satellites. But just in the last two years, this number has doubled. Okay, and that shows you the growing interest. And that's because all these, the, 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 the development costs are dropping and the launch costs are dropping and, we, and they're gonna continue to drop for reasons I already mentioned. So here is the bad news. You haven't heard it already. Uh, the debris will grow for another 200 years without any new launches. Why is that? Because in the most crowded orbits, and they tend to, to be over uh, the poles, uh, they will be continued, there will, uh, collisions between the objects will continue. And here is maybe good news or the even worse news, and that is over 70,000 new launches are being planned. 70,000. Okay. That is a huge number. And it keeps growing. Okay, so here's my question to, to the world. And, and I've, been, I've been screaming this for 13 years, but it, only now it seems like that, you know, people are waking up and listening. Do we need a tragedy or a catastrophe before we do something about this? Do we wait until, the, the, until crucial orbital bands become unusable? And they, they could become unusable through a thing called the Kessler syndrome, which is, it has to do with, uh, well, if you ever saw the movie Gravity, where, one, where you have a uh, runaway uh, collisions happening, where one thing collides with another thing, it causes debris to fly off, and uh, then it, it hits something else, and that, that causes more debris, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing I want to say about gravity is that it, it did show, I think it did show graphically the other, the um, problem. Uh, one thing that that was not true, and there were several things that, you know, they fudged on, but for cinematic reason. Uh, one of the things that you would not, that you would, that was not true is that you would not see most of it before it hit you because it's coming so fast. You know, in the show, in, in the movie, they show you can see it coming, you know. Well, I don't think so. A lot of that stuff, you're not going to see most of it. Here we go. So what are we talking about? I mean, we're talking about basically our modern way of life. Uh, you know, GPS, navigation on land, sea, and air, radio and TV, business, finance, credit cards. Uh, all that stuff is linked to, with satellites, weather reporting. People don't realize it, but we take weather reporting for granted. Oh, here comes a hurricane. Okay, we better do something. Well, guess what? You know, before satellites in, in 1900, when Galveston was hit, 8,000 people died. 8,000 people died because they didn't know it was coming. So, yeah, there's more. You know, there's, there's environmental and climate monitoring and so forth, and cell phones, uh, search and rescue. Here's the, here's the deal, and this, this is something that's really important to understand because people get this mixed up. There's a difference between mitigation and remediation. Mitigation is good. Minimizing the amount of, of new debris is good. I'm not knocking it. We'll talk more about it, but it's not enough. We need cleanup, and that's called remediation. Okay, and you might see some other terms when you're talking about remediation, that is active debris removal. And we're going to talk a lot about something else, in-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. And sometimes it's called on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manu manufacturing. ISAM and OSA, it's the same thing. But basically what it means is to refuel or repair or reuse whole parts or metals of defunct spacecraft. And you do that you can clean up at the same time. All right, so we need active debris removal of both large and small objects. How do we do that? How do we get there? I'm not, I can have a separate talk about this. We need greatly 
enhance safe space situational awareness. Okay, so space situational awareness and greatly enhance space traffic management. Those are basically separate talks, but I just want to put it as a placeholder. That's really happening, uh, really important, and I think it's just starting to happen. Okay, so for these enhancements, we need objects to be spotted down to a half of a centimeter. So basically, um, half the size of a pea, I guess, or smaller, uh, about a quarter inch across uh, or so. Uh, and we need ac accurate predictions that are timely and ac accurate, and so that so that uh, evasive. Um, uh, 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 maneuvers can be carried out by one or the other spacecraft. Okay, and sometimes, and I think this, we're moving towards a place where they have both evasive uh, maneuvers should be done, or most most well can be done, autonomy uh, 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 automatically, so that you know, autonomously is what I'm trying to do for autonomously, you know, so you don't have to have some guy studying it and, uh, you know, figuring out how far to move it. So here we're talking about, oh yeah, it, it has to be done internationally too. Why? Why is it has to be done internationally? It's simple because this is an international problem. You saw you saw the, the, the chart at the beginning, you know, who's contributing? I mean, they had all these spacefaring countries uh, contributing, but the United States, Soviet Union, now Russia, and China have the most. Now, some of these people are considered by others bad actors, but I'm telling you, this is an international problem. And space is one area where, and this is, I, uh, this is where I diverge again a little bit from, from others, perhaps. But space is one area where there has been cooperation in the past. And we cannot solve this without cooperation between the big three in the future, in the long run. We can start without it, but we can't completely solve it without cooperation. So I could go more into that. But anyway, I already mentioned ESAM, or OSAM, in-orbit servicing assembly and manufacture, manufacturing, manufacture, using, and this is important to private contractors. Why private contractors? because we're talking about jobs now, jobs and experience. And, and it's very, very important that we have best practices for cleanup. How do we get best practices? Well, we start off getting multiple people involved, space companies, universities, and governments. We evolve the best practices. We start out with, with the precautionary approach, and we see what works and what turns out to be best. We do it little by little. So the good news is, and I wish I had this information for every country, but I do have it for the United States. And I'm very pleased to see that nationally the work is beginning. So we, in, in July, last July, um, the government, the US government released the National Orbital Degree Implementation Plan calling for enhanced uh, orbital debris mitigation and remediation. So this came out of the Orbital Debris Interagency Working Group, which didn't exist before. But uh, thankfully, under this administration, it does exist now. Also, uh, now this is, this is a controversial move, but I'm glad it happened. And this is where uh, not everybody would agree with me. Um, we don't have any consensus in the policy committee, but the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, in September adopted a draft order to strengthen orbital debris mitigation, requiring that all satellites at altitudes 2,000 kilometers or less deorbit within five years of end, of end of mission. Okay, why is this controversial? It's controversial because the, the Federal Communications Commission is not seen as the correct uh, agency to do this. But from a personal point of view, and others will disagree with me, I'm thrilled that they did it. Somebody had to shake the tree. 
Yes, I do agree that it should probably be the Office of Space Commerce. And this goes to another uh, one of the questions that was asked in my list of questions here. Uh, yeah, Office of Space Commerce, or maybe the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. The, the uh, Office of Space Commerce comes out of the Department of Commerce. The uh, Office of Commercial Space Transportation comes from the uh, uh, Department of, of uh, Transportation. Uh, I favor uh, Office of Space Commerce for various reasons. Yes, they should have done it. They should have gotten together with FCC and uh, and the other offices and NASA and, and put out this. But the fact that they did this, that FCC took this effort, now has shaken up the, the bureaucracy uh, in the United States and internationally. Now I'm starting to see international uh, some international movement about this. And I can tell you this, that it's not going far, far enough. First of all, let me just tell you about the 25 year, uh, the, 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 the current one guideline or rule, if you want to call it in the United States, 25 years to the orbit, it was, it was almost completely ignored. It was ignored. Okay, so, you know, no one was sitting there thinking, gosh, 20, 25 years, but maybe I should, we should deorbit this satellite. No, it wasn't happening. So it was mostly ignored. And I can tell you that this draft order, it doesn't go far enough. In my opinion, it will be mostly ignored as well. It should be clear cut, end of mission. And as far as I know, there's only one company that's really paying attention to this end of mission point, and that's SpaceX. Believe it or not, it's SpaceX. I, I, I hear that they're doing something, they're trying to get their, their, their uh, satellites down at the end of mission. So again, it's controversial. Uh, you've got my opinion now. Uh, it should be end of mission. So, okay, that's just telling you, um, okay. I would just say instead of the orbiting, I would say it's much better to recycle or reuse the satellite's material, right? To repair the satellite or the upper stage, to gain control of it again, extend or enhance its mission or give it a new mission. You know, a lot can be done with modules, putting on modules for, for pointing and for attitude and, and, and for, or, uh, you know, fuel modules and so forth, they extend missions. So I think that this is a lot better than deorbiting because one of the bad things about deorbiting, uh, and I'm, I'm for deorbiting if there's no better choice, but uh, it does create a certain amount of air pollution. So here we have, a, and if it's a very, very large structure, you could hit something with it, you know, like a person on earth. And that would bring liability. We'll talk about liability later on. So, yeah, why not use it to assemble something new? So the White House also uh, in December uh, released a national in-service uh, uh, assembly and manufacturing plan. This is the first ESOM uh, plan that I have ever heard of a, a country doing. And um, this, again, is really a, a step in the right direction. So it does open up new possibilities for the commercial industry and also for cleaning up orbital debris, orbital debris in a way that actually adds value. So um, just to let you know that the International Committee plans to bring these kinds of recommendations to the uh, to international meetings and conferences, okay? So there are a bunch of, of new emerging country uh, companies that are involved with in space um, uh, servicing and assembly and manufacture. And I'm just, I just picked out uh, six, okay? But just to let you know, there's three times this easy easy three times this, and then others that are doing other things in space. So uh, here's, here's three though. Uh, Cislunar uh, Industries, uh, we'll see something else. That first slide, 
had a lot to do with cislunar. They're recycling. They're all about recycling debris metals. In other words, taking debris metals, turning them into rods, and through a, a company called Newman Space, what they're doing is making propellant out of it. So not only can you get this stuff, right? You can turn it into a plasma and, and use it for propellant. So you're, you're cleaning and also you're, you're, you're making fuel. Uh, Starship Aerospace is another one. Uh, and you can see what they do, space tugs and so forth. Action Systems. Uh, which provides electrospray, electrospray propulsion for starfish. Uh, there, we're going to talk about propulsion. Uh, fuel can be very expensive, but there are ways to avoid using combustible fuels in low Earth orbit to move around. So nanoracks, we're going to talk about them. They're they're looking at ways to use uh, spent. Uh, upper stages and turn them into workshops, uh, assembly or, or, or you know, uh, staging areas and so forth. And we will have a slide on that. Now here's, a, here's something so, so exciting. I was really surprised to find out. And it, and it addresses one of the other questions I got. There was a, when will this, when do you think this technology can be used? Well, look at this. Space logistics, I'm saying it started being used two years ago. And since 2020, they, they put up two mission extension vehicles providing propulsion and pointing control to satellites and geo. When they did that, they extended the life of those satellites. And those satellites will not now become orbital debris. Okay? So it's already starting. They have another. They have a, they have on plans. They have plans to install another pod in in six years and to extend the life six years of another satellite in 2024. So it is already starting. There's a lot to do, but it's already starting. And then, of course, here's another one: Astroscale and Orbit Fab. And this is talking about uh, refueling, uh, having tugs out there, shuttles to refuel. Of other satellites, and again, that keeps the, in a way that's mitigation because if it's if it's extending the life of something that is still alive and still controllable, that's mitigation. But if it's already dead, that's remediation because you're taking something that's free out and and putting it back into service. And this is the same. This this is the same. Uh, slide I started with. This shows you the amount of collaboration you see here in Newman Space, and you see Cislunar, these folks, and, and others. These folks are really, really collaborative, and they're working with the Colorado School of Mines, and uh, this is really an important step. Here is NanoRax repurposing, um, and they've done this uh, with a a booster or, a, or an upper stage already that they've already started this kind of work with an upper stage. They didn't find the upper stage. They actually, they, they used the upper stage that they were using, that they, that they had used to launch. But they're already starting this. And this is the kind of things they, they, they want to do. And again, I, I'm not sure I can read this because of this bar that's across my screen, but uh, you see that Mike Lewis, the CTO of Nanorax, said in 2018 that he would that Nanorax is repurposing to turn junk into gold. So it's value, it's valuable if you can do something with it. If it's just up there creating a hazard, it's not, it's it's only a threat. So here we go. And you see space logistics. This is a graphic showing how they can add. A, a module to uh, to augment propulsion to keep satellites moving in space. And there's many others. Somebody else asked about what do you do about the small debris? Well, gosh, there's all kinds of ideas out there. Uh, there's this there's this electrodynamic uh, uh, idea of electrodynamic big like a big net going to hit a lot of stuff. I've seen another one where it's a big, it looks like a big catcher's mitt. It's got multiple layers for the small stuff. 
Um, the thing about, and there's touchless technology where you don't really, you can move things. You know, one of the problems is that this stuff is tumbling and it's, you know, it's going very fast, it's tumbling around. So what do you do? Well, it's better not to touch it. And there's various ways to control it without touching it, okay? So uh, you see this here, this clean space one here, you see, well, that's great if you want to grab it, but, but you know, in order to grab it, you're, it's going to be very tricky because you have to line up the same tumble and speed and everything. It's, it's, it's better to at least uh, move it into place or, or, or control it to somewhat by not touching it. Basically, it's, it's a very old technology, electron gun technology uh, of, of, of shooting electrons at, at something, at, at, at an object, and the, the object becomes more negative compared to your positive your positive spacecraft and so you can attract it that way uh, or you can push it out depending on what you what you send out to it etc so uh, there are all kinds of things going on very very uh, uh this eddy it's electrodynamic um uh, uh electrodynamic um vehicle it's a big ribbon it's like a tether in space it's got a current going through and, and it works by and, and there's another company that does that has um, what are your beams instead of tethers uh, that work on the same principle. Basically, you don't need fuel because um, you got a current going through something, okay, and it 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 moves, it pushes against, and pulls against the 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 magnetic field lines of the Earth, okay. Only works in low Earth orbit, but there's a lot of junk in, uh, in uh, uh, low Earth orbit, and um, so uh, so in tethers can work the same way. Point is that there are a lot of ways, a lot of technologies that are being developed now, and um, anyway, uh, and here's just. Uh, here's something that was launched from the International Space Station that, by the Europeans, and they're testing all these other, you know, uh, <laughs> nets and harpoons and drag sails and so forth. So we're just at the beginning of this, and you can see Airbus is involved with that. So, and, and NASA is getting into it with their OSAM-1, it's the same thing as ESAM, yeah. so on orbit. Uh, yeah servicing and uh, assembly and manufacturing uh, gadget uh, spacecraft for air testing. Okay, so here we go. Let's see, how far are we, Bert? Do we in like 30 minutes or so? Where's the time? Or did I go beyond that already? Um, uh, we're, we're good, we're good out. You can continue. Uh, we okay. Take, if you need to take another 10 or 15 minutes, perfect. Well, okay, I'm, I'll try to get through this uh, fast. Uh, I recommend, and again, not everybody uh, believe, uh, you know, would go along with this, but I recommend that we move towards establishing customary international law. And how do we do that? We do this by, by the governments and uh, private companies uh, starting with best practices evolving best practices on a unilateral, bilateral, multilateral way, uh, uh, basis. So uh, customary international law, don't be afraid of it. Uh, it can be, some people go, oh my God, that takes centuries. Well, it can. It can take a thousand years or more, in fact. Um, but uh, it can also go very quickly, very quickly. So, uh, and I can give you examples of both. So I think another thing that's very important is for, and this could start with a national government first. I have international governments doing a, 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 a uh, uh, using private contractors, designating one defunct upper stage for repair, refurbishing, and repurposing. And then you repeat, repeat, repeat. I think a national government could do it first and then induce willing partners into it little by little, step by step. And this is how you evolve best practices. But you must avoid the liability quagmire. How do you do that? Well, 
It turns out that um, Article uh, uh, Article Eight of the Outer Space Treaty says that a launching party uh, retains jurisdiction control. Well, jurisdiction control is kind of sounds like like ownership, doesn't it? So my point in this this is uh, answers the three of the questions here about property and ownership. I th there are layers of ownership to an object. Okay, because of Article Eight and other articles, including Article Six of the Outer Space Treaty, you can't. There's there's at least a a a, a layer of ownership. It doesn't matter what company it was, doesn't matter what uh, whatever else, wherever else was involved, because of these articles, if we're going to work within the Outer Space Treaty, there's a layer of ownership and responsibility. And it requires, as you can look at Article 6, it, it means that, uh, that, that, the, that, the comp that the countries involved this, the, to the treaty, the space, the, the parties to the treaty, must carry out authorization and continuing supervision. All of that not only brings a layer of ownership, but it also brings liability risk. Now, liability, liability is something that can be avoided or fortuned. All right, so um, I better just move on and not go into it a little bit further. So because of Article 7, um, and various parties can be considered launching states, okay? And they will be internationally liable for damage to another state party, okay? And they can be jointly and severably liable. In fact, they are jointly and severably liable, okay? Because of the liability convention, Article 5. However, the good news is that Article 5 of the liability convention also gives you a way to apportion liability. And in fact, the International Space Station has an agreement, a, 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 a multilateral agreement that contains a cross waiver of liability for everybody involved. So not even apportionment, it's a waiver, but both things that can be done. So liability actually can be taken care of. So a recommendation that came out is actually not my idea, it was Peter, um, Peter Garrison's idea, but I fully support it. His idea is to um, is to create an international space salvage entity, which will assume the liability and, and therefore the the ownership. This layer of ownership, plus it doesn't matter if it's SpaceX rocket or what who's got, there's still this layer of ownership. Okay, so assumes it takes on the liability and then pays pays it's an international be an international entity it pays commercial salvers to safely deorbit and if something or deorbit or repair or enhance or move it to a salvage orbit so it can be taken care of later and they don't get paid and this comes out of the maritime industry you don't get paid a salver does not get paid unless there's a cure so no cure no pay all right, so costs and profits would be shared per agreement. Now you're probably thinking, well, how can you move? How, how can you get? Well, let, before I go into how to pay for it, uh, so this another question that I had was, whose property does it become, and how do you move property? Well, it turns out that there is now. Uh, there that three satellites that I know of, uh, two from Great Britain to China and one from Sweden, or from Great Britain to Sweden, if I remember correctly, the ownership has been transferred from one state party to the Outer Space Treaty to another state party. Okay, so there's already a precedent. It can be done, and it could, and it can be uh, given to a an orbital debris um, entity salvage entity. Um, here's the problem though, and this goes, it's not in my uh, talk, but it's in the question. Uh, there's, this, there's this question if, 
if you launch it, you should remove it. Here's the problem. Here's the problem, okay? That most of it cannot be identified. Most of the trackable stuff cannot be identified. Okay, so we have all this trackable stuff, right? Fine. Most of it can't be identified. Less, less than half, okay? Um, well, let's say 60% of it cannot be identified. I, I see from the chat somebody said it's not economically feasible. Uh, okay, let's, let's think about this, folks. <clears throat> Here you got uh, uh, millions of dollars invested in a, in a satellite that's going to go defunct. Do you think somebody's willing to pay to keep it going? Do you think it'd be cheaper to keep it putting a module on it, keep it going, than to launch a new satellite? Now, what do you think? All right. Well, think about that. Now, getting back to this bigger uh, picture here of how to pay for it. I mean, there's, there's, there are only so many uh, ways you can do this. National taxes, I don't think will, all right, that's dead on arrival. Launch fees, yeah, they have to be internationally coordinated. Why? Because if you just charge launch fees to U.S. Uh, or Italian uh, launches, and uh, then that disadvantages those folks and they'll just move to another country. So it's got to be internationally coordinated. Uh, same way with parking fees. Um, yeah, I have Joe Carroll, a friend of mine, who's always talking about parking fees. Um, yeah, okay, that's, that's another one. But the one I like the best is that um, an end user fee of one cent uh, on your per dollar on your on your bill. I think that most people wouldn't even notice it uh, unless there was a flashing light. You get all these other little fees, you have no idea what they are on your you know, phone bill or whatever it is, your TV. Um, I don't think you hardly notice and it would raise billions of dollars, billions of dollars, okay? So every year. And that, I, my suggestion is to go into a, a, a trust fund. Uh, international trust fund. And of course, this takes a lot of uh, international work. Uh, so, um, oops, I can't seem to move my, why is this happening? I'm not able to move my screen now. Uh, don't know why. Can you still hear me? You still hear you still hear you, Al. Why don't you? Uh, okay, try I can't. Well, I can't move my screen to that screen, but I think we're just about at the end anyway. Okay. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, let's say we're in the, at the end. Uh, I think we only have two maybe uh, slides after this. Uh, so that's it. Let's let's make a problem. Let's make a problem into a business. Let's turn treasure into gold. There's a lot of it out there, and it's worth a lot if you can do something with it. So, any questions beyond, uh, maybe I can see some of the chat questions now, or you can, someone, Bert, can tell me what yeah. they are. Yeah, uh, why don't you stop sharing, Al? Okay, let me yeah, so stop you get you back on the full screen. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so, there, there were quite a few questions that came in on the Q&A. Uh, so why don't we start with that? I know you addressed some of the ones that came in from our audience beforehand when they registered, yeah. but I'll uh, do my best. I'll yeah, do my we, best. So we'll try to, you know, we've got a little time, but uh, oh, uh, Carl was very prolific with the questions here, so I'll, I'll get a few <laughs> of his. Uh, but uh, and I'm I'm probably know the answer to the first one. It just wouldn't be possible. But should there be a moratorium on how many satellites any country should place into orbit? Oh God! Um, <laughs> I well, there should maybe uh, it, it's not going to happen. We're basically we're in a race now. Uh, I mean, basically, uh, it's not just SpaceX, but they started it uh, with the reusability and dropping uh, costs for launching. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, we have all these new emerging uh, uh, launch companies, uh, more than we can use. And it's and it's it's a race now. Uh, United Arab Emirates is in on it. Luxembourg's in on it. Uh, so, no, I, I it just ain't gonna happen. Um, 
I'm not sure it should happen, but um, anyway, it's it's not going to happen. So that's my answer. Yeah, it's kind of like the the issues with uh, controlling emissions. You know, the big developing countries do most of it, and as other countries start developing, they're saying, "Wait a second! Now you're telling what? us you can't." Yes, uh, you know what it, what it's like. Well, it's like after World War II, let's say 1920, 1930, 40, it's what was happening to aviation. Okay, that's happening to space now. And uh, it, the, the horses are out of the barn. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's a matter of trying to control it now. It's a matter of trying to control it. But you don't want to, you don't want to tighten the controls ahead of time. The, 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 the types of controls should come up organically with all the players, all the stakeholders involved. Because if, if a government tries to just start regulating or, 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 or let's say the UN comes up with a new model treaty, oh, we got to do it. it. That treaty, those regulations could be out of date and, and uh, very, very soon, very soon now. So... Um, yeah, all the players need to be involved. Very good. Uh, I see Marcus has his hand raised. Marcus, we'll get to you in just a second. I want to try to go through a few of the others that uh, came in. And uh, let's see, Carl asked another question about, is, is, uh, is there really any, is there, a bill, is there a way to control where space junk will eventually hit the Earth? Yes, a big stuff. Um, the big space Europeans, the Chinese, uh, they can get it, uh, and the U.S. can get the big chunks pretty well controlled. You know, I mean, seven tenths of the Earth is water. It should be called water instead of Earth. So, so uh, I, these these can be, but remember the other the other problem. Even if that, even if you can do that perfectly, which you can't, but usually you can, eighty percent of the time, let's say ninety uh, percent. Uh, the other problem is the air pollution that's caused by these uh, orbit deorbiting uh, pieces of junk. Right. Let yeah, me... I see somebody saying that the Chinese do not bother to do it. Well, there's always there are always bad players, folks. Yeah. There's bad actors. So can and won't are two different things. And But again, how do you get bad actors in line? Okay, so do you, do you get bad actors in line by ignoring them? Does that help? That's, no, they just keep doing I'll, it. I'll leave that, I'll leave that <laughs> as a hypothetical for people to ponder. But let me ask a more philosophical question that that I didn't see uh, anyone else ask. It, you know, you you've raised uh, some real concerns about the future safety of not just uh, our satellites that keep our world functioning, but people who are occupying space stations and spacecraft. And there's a lot of talk. You you shared a lot of that today about some ideas. But it appears to me it's it's all like it's kind of like the argument over infrastructure. You know, we want to build a you know flashy new building, but cities don't want to invest in the, the sewers or the roads in order to have those flashy new buildings. Until and, and, until yeah, until the, yeah, until everything collapses, right? Right, right. And, like in Florida, where you had this building collapse, or various places where bridges have collapsed. Ah. Uh, God, this is human nature, Bert. Right. I, I don't know what to do with it. You know, it's if we would uh, here. Look at this. Give me. I'll give you one example. In two thousand nine, a, a, a dead Cosmos satellite hit an Iridium satellite. Right. Two years before that, a vice president of Iridium was asked, "What are the chances of 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 a collision of one of your Iridium satellites?" Right? And you know what he said? 50 million to one. Okay. He said, I believe in the big sky uh, concept of, of space. I think it's 50 million 
to one. Two years later, it happened. So, right, you know, that's just people. I mean, I'm I'm hoping it. I'm hoping it doesn't take that. I see some good. I good, see some good signs out of the out of the United States, and and I think you know. The U.S. has been, uh, it has been a leader, and I think uh, in space, and I think, I think there's a good chance. Uh, we, you know, we have the international committee. The international committee can bring some of these uh, same. Uh, we have to be careful. We don't want to be there pounding our chests. Right. Uh, but, but I think we can make some some good uh, arguments about why it's good for this to happen internationally. All these things. Absolutely. Uh, I think I want to turn it over to uh, Marcus. Marcus, you had your hand up for a little bit. So I'm going to allow you to talk, Marcus, and ask your question uh, to Al. So you just need to make sure you're not muted. I think you're good to go. Marcus, we're, we're listening. Hello? Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. I can hear you. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak on the Orbits Act. I can't remember if you spoke on that already, but it looked like uh, there was some approval at the end of last year. And then I don't know if it got stalled and if it needs to be reinitiated again. Or do, can you speak on, on that and your thoughts on yeah, the Orbits Act? I wish, yeah, I have a vague memory of it. I am sorry that um, I don't really remember the details very well. I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, I do remember it being uh, proposed. And um, yeah, I, sh I guess I'm going to have to check and get back Can we, to Can uh, we check on it, Al, and maybe set sure. it up? Yeah. Sure. I do remember it being proposed. And so much was happening. I think I was in Italy at the time, Corbett's Act. Okay, I'll check. And how do I get back to Marcus on that? Oh, uh, we can make sure I can I can get it to Marcus. No problem. Now, some somebody just said uh, Marcus. Somebody just said that it passed the Senate. Can I see that again? That chat. Let me look. Let's the Senate see. passed it, but the House didn't take it up. Oh yeah, that's the usual. Uh, yeah, we have had. Uh, I hate to say this, but mm, maybe I shouldn't say it. Um, well, I'll just say this, that uh, the National Space Society um, has had trouble getting some proposals taken up uh, and bills taken up by the House. And um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. And we can see but, if we can do some other but, but look, but look. It, you know, it's not over. It's not over till it's over. And we keep plugging away. The policy committee just keeps plugging away. And, um, you know, this has to do, and if you want to help with this, actually, you can, you can uh, reach uh, me and, and um, you know, through the National Space Society. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we have... Um, there's an arm, we're connected, National, the policy committee is connected to a group of folks uh, that uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's a group of other space uh, 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 organizations and they lobby Congress directly. You can get involved with that if you want, but uh, you just let me know. Uh, can you, uh, Bert, could you be the go-between if somebody... Sure, yeah. Uh, what we'll be doing is I'll be sending out the recording to everybody once we have it. So I can I can also make note if people have any additional questions. We can you can we can pass them and pass them back. So no problem there. Yeah. Great. So, Let me take a few others from Carl that he had in there into yeah. in our Q&A. Uh, and he has an, an interesting idea about consolidating satellite functions into space stations rather than having a lot of separate satellites. Has uh, that been thought of? Uh, yes, it has. Um, that comes under the assembly. Remember ESAM? It's uh, right. servicing, assembly, and manufacture. Uh, yes, it has been uh, thought of, in fact, and um, uh, making whole new structures that way. 
So a lot of this, the metal out there can be reused and the parts can be reused and, and that which can't be used can be re recycled. Uh, and you can do things, uh, a lot of things easier in space than you can on the earth. Uh, you know, for instance, you have a lot of direct sunlight, you know, 24 seven that you don't have on the earth. You don't have an atmosphere to, to penetrate. And also because of the, the uh, the lack of gravity, of Earth gravity, to deal with, uh, that gives you a lot more, uh, you can make large structures uh, that would be fragile on Earth, but are fine in space. So, yes, it has been thought of, and it's a good idea. Interesting, yes, yeah, very, yeah. great idea. Yes, uh, let's see, now William asks, uh, uh, I know it's not your specific focus, but I'm interested in how this subject overlaps with planetary defense. Okay, well, I do, <laughs> I do believe in planetary defense and it's very, very important, important. Uh, how it overlaps. Um, well, I would think that the overlap uh, would have to do with, uh, with uh, orbiting telescopes, um, you know, um, there's this, you know, telescopes, uh, uh, cameras, telescopic cameras, uh, satellites that have them can point in any direction. I mean, can be made to point in any direction. So I, I, I think that the, the only connection that I can think of right now is that uh, there would be value in pointing out away from the Earth as well as uh, towards the Earth. And um, I know that uh, this is not the big camera that we're looking at for the neo cam was called i'm not sure it still is called the neo cam uh, but that was not going to be in earth orbit but uh, i don't see why earth orbit cannot also be used for um you know astronomical viewing as well as earth viewing right I do want to point people to the chat. I, uh, Bob has been putting some uh, interesting things in the chat, and I want to call his, everyone's attention. He made a comment there that maybe the, the way it, it, the question was asked that sp space consolidation, space station consolidation of space capabilities is exactly the opposite of the way the industry is going. So um, I just wanted to, to get that out there. So, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of perspectives on this. Yeah. And I see somebody uh, reminded me that it's now Neo SM. Neo SM, yeah, yeah. We got a pretty. I've been, short I've been away from this for for a few yeah. years, but, but <laughs> I'm being I'm being reminded now. Yeah, you thank you, be, Neo Neo SM. We've got a sharp audience and members. Yeah, yeah. I can uh, tell from the questions. Yes, yes. Uh, one question that uh, I, I'm looking at that came in that you you didn't address, but uh, uh, I know there's a lot of uh, market out there for things that have flown in space. Uh, if you go to the auctions or people selling things that have flown in space or, but uh, someone asked about some of the satellites, you know, you're talking about recycling materials, but is there an aftermarket for collectors for some of the, you think there's might be an aftermarket for collectors for some of the satellite material? Interesting question. <laughs> aftermarket for collectors. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that like, there could be, there could be, uh, I hadn't really thought about it before. Um, you know, I've thought about it as far as the surface of the moon, you know, the stuff that's there. And by the way, uh, space debris, I, I talk about orbital debris because space debris can be uh, on the surface of the moon or another planetary suit. So when I say orbital debris, I'm talking about in orbit around the Earth. Right. So and I think there's a distinction there. Um, after, but whatever, even if there were an aftermarket uh, for collectors, uh, I think it would, you'd have, still have to have a space salvage entity involved. Because exactly. You'd, yeah. you'd still have the same property, you still have the same, uh, you need to transfer the property somehow, or accept the property. In the case, in the case of where you cannot 
determine who the, the original uh, launcher was or owner was or country was. There has to be a process for accepting it as property and then being liable for it and then being able to do all these other things. Sell it. Right. So, yeah, that's got to be part of it. Very good. Uh, Larry asks a question. Uh, is there any 3D CAD standardization that allows companies to exchange CAD data so that a servicing company can design something that works with an existing older design? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. 3D CAD. Let's see. We'll have to see if we can get some more. Somebody audience. says people will buy anything. And by God, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Stamps. I mean, you know, okay. We can oh, just yeah, no, it's, I think Bob is correct pet there. Rocks. <laughs> Remember the pet rocks? <laughs> uh, pet rock that flew in space. There you go. I uh, see Larry has his hand up. Larry, you can ask. Yeah, I just, just wanted to point out, if you have, if you have a... Uh, an agency that's in charge of uh, the salvage. The thing is, they could pull a, what I call the beers. And the thing is, they can limit the, the stuff. Uh, so if any, if, uh, to prevent the price of any anything they're selling from souvenirs to fall like that, they would just limit the number of uh, things that they would send down or something. Uh, okay. They would control, okay. control the whole thing. Yeah, Larry, but remember, the beers is a private company. I mean, they took over a country, but that's a nice point. That's what I'm saying. You're talking about so, the entity. So my, my point is that this space salvage entity has to be international, multilateral. Uh, everybody's got to, you know, all this, the big stakeholders <laughs> in on it. However, you, the point you, I think you may be getting to is that someone could start collecting, buying stuff from the space salvage entity and then corner a market. That could happen. A private individual could do that. Right. I mean, that's a ways off, though. <laughs> Let somebody me says, <laughs> somebody <laughs> says, pet space rocks, I'll sell those. There you go. Uh, I, think we've, I think we started a whole new industry here. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, yeah, let's not, let's, I think all the, the frozen monkeys have been, uh, and dogs have been deorbited, poor things. Yeah. <laughs> by now. One, uh, uh, let me take a, one more question that was submitted, and it has to do sure. with uh, China and Russia. You talked about bad players. It's one thing uh, to not care about what happens to your space junk, uh, but they're also been very uh, anxious to test their anti-satellite weaponry. And, sure. you know, what, you know, what efforts are being done on the international level to, to try to curb that? Okay, uh, I can tell you two things. Uh, okay, okay, both these countries have recently done anti-satellite testing, and as well as India, by the way. So, the United States is setting an example by uh, by passing a uh, legislation or I'm not sure if it's legislation or some other lower norm, but maybe someone can uh, correct me on this, but there's been some ruling of the United States that we will no longer do tight satellite testing, at least the kind that creates debris. Well, there's, you can shoot things down, you know, but shooting them up and where they spray, things spray up, that's a different story. So I think it's it's nicely worded that way, but I think the United States is setting an example, and um, and on the national there's this thing called UN COPUS, which is uh, stands for the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. The International Committee attends these, and in usually in in the past in um, uh, either remotely or in person. And that is anti-satellite testing has come up there, and we will continue to bring it up as something that is, um, you know, bad acting. And uh, what can you do? We don't have. There's no. There's no international police um, at this point. It's basically shaming, and uh, 
people can say, well, that's so what, and people don't care, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, I think eventually international norms do, uh, do matter, and there are penalty for not following good behavior in space. There can be penalties. But again, how do you, how do you make the penalties? You make the penalties by denying them something they want. Okay? But you can't do that unless you have a relationship with them. Okay? And again, I'm out on a limb on this one, for, according to a lot of other people, but I don't see how you can change bad behavior by ignoring it. Okay? So, and, and Brow, and just fussing it at, at uh, geopolitical partners or, or people or ad, ad actors ain't going to do anything for human rights. It's not going to do anything for anything. It's not going to help at all. Zero. In fact, it could even promote it. Mm. So, so in my opinion, and this is from coming out of the State Department, just watching people, uh, you know, geopolitical actors who come in with all kinds of historical baggage, Watching this happen over the years, my opinion is you can't change behavior by ignoring it. Very good, Al. I think on that note, we'll, we'll close out. Uh, and just want to thank you so much for a really informative and uh, I'll call it, uh, uh, oh, you know, we created an awareness of some of us that we didn't have before about this issue. And hopefully we will see progress. Uh, as we move forward, and yep, yeah, keep your fingers crossed, and, and we'll keep watching what the uh, NSS Policy Committee is doing. So, uh, again, thank you so much for the presentation and taking the time. Uh, people might remember Al has done a, several of these for us in the past. In fact, he did probably the very first town hall we did uh, before we even started this series uh, during the uh the pandemic. So, and talking about the, the, the policy committee. So thanks Al for uh, your continued support of the space forum program and NSS and all you're doing uh, to further our efforts to become a space bearing civilization. Well, you're very welcome. It's my great pleasure. Thanks for this yeah. opportunity. And, and thanks to this, this audience, this audience, there are great questions. They are very good. It, it's uh, it's really impressive and uh, makes it a lot of fun to do these sessions because we get such great questions. So everybody, uh, I do want to again thank Al. I'm going to thank my uh, colleague Larry Ahern, uh, who helps us uh, organize these events, and of course my colleague uh, Fred Becker, who dropped off with a Wi-Fi issue, but he is back now. So uh, making sure that everything is running smoothly. So Fred, thanks so much. Uh, everybody, I'm going to share my screen one last time uh, as we close out this for the evening. So here we go. Let me get all this stuff out of the way. And so again, thanks, Al. So everybody, uh, again, I want to thank you for attending. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, wishing you a great evening for those of you who in our, are in our time zone. And for those of you in tomorrow's time zone, have a great day ahead and a great weekend. Uh, stay safe, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks uh, for the next Space Forum. So everyone, take care. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Bye, everybody. Good night. I'm going to stop.